And it was amazing how I was able to make a sales pitch sound newsworthy. Maybe this is where fake news began its weird its ugly head, but <laughs> So the Super Finch invented fake news. <laughs> <laughs> this is Super Fast Business with James Shranko. James Shranko. Helping you build your business super fast. 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 James Schramko here. Welcome back to superfastbusiness.com. Today is a very special episode because we will be taking a trip down memory lane and we'll be uncovering some of the backstory to some of the stories you may have heard me mention on this particular podcast. And I've brought along a dear friend of mine, one of my earliest contacts in the industry, Kerry Finch. How are you? Yeah, I'm well, thanks, James. Lovely to be here. Kerry, uh, we go back a long way. Mm -hmm. I met you when I still had a job. That's how far. And I met you at the job, which is even more interesting. And as I recall, I was the general manager in my last job and I had been building up my online business on the side. And I was pretty excited about the idea that I might one day be able to quit my job. And I feel like I was getting close to that sort of quit point. And at the time you had come into the dealership and were helping out in a front desk reception role as a, a temporary assistant because you were doing other stuff like travel, tour guiding, and it was just a, a fill-in thing for you. But I do recall you did a exceptionally good job and our receptionist was away and I think we'd found out she wasn't coming back and... I asked you if you could have a look at a job description that I'd written on, and I asked you about you know, what sort of things are important for that role, having done it for a while, because you had contextual experience, and you took the draft away, and then you brought it back straight away with changes, and I said, well, that was quick, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you said, yep, and I looked at it, and it was really good. You'd made some incredible refinements, and I said, why are you doing this job instead of writing articles from home in your tracksuit pants and you said what's writing articles <laughs> and I said well let me tell you I said this whole internet thing and you can get ten dollars per article to write for Americans and you can go into forums and you were very interested in how this all works and I said that uh, you know I'm into this too and I'll be doing that and you said well why are you still here <laughs> and I said well watch this space and then I think I commissioned you to take over writing my articles because I really sucked at writing articles back then and you had an extraordinary talent for it and that was over 10 years ago now. Yeah, I know. What a lot's happened in that time. Yeah, I was so frightened about this um, the prospect of writing articles because you, you were a pretty scary dude in that dealership and I didn't quite know what it was all about. But once we sat down and you explained it all to me, I thought, yeah, I could, I could give that a crack and the rest is history. It was really a, an interesting time for me because by day I was probably a scary dude. I was the general manager and I was, I had my sort of battle face on. I really had to go to work. And, and what most people don't realize is that at least for the last year of that job, I really expected every day that I went to work might be my last day because I was feeling that the business was running itself quite well without me and that the uh, economic fallout in the United States was likely to have an impact in the Australian market. And I was really feeling like a chicken with its head on the block, and I was waiting for that axe to swing down. So I was really in scramble mode to get up and running. But by night, it was just me, the one-man show, and I know every listener who's embarked on the online journey can probably relate to this, where you are doing everything, every single aspect from concept and idea creation through to execution, like typing out the words, putting up the website, pointing the domain. It was incredibly slow and difficult. And I realized that me writing articles was extra slow. I mean, I can't touch type, as you call it, still. And luckily for me, digital uh, technology has improved now where I can at least record stuff and have it transcribed. And of course, the team are fantastic at doing that. And that's why I prefer this medium of podcasting. I get to talk for a living instead of type. But there are people who can type really fast. And not only that, you have to know what to type. And I think that's what you brought to the table, Kerry, is you brought experience and you brought knowledge and you have a lot of practical application skills and how you can take a brief and then create something that's not just a regurgitation or a copy 
or a concatenized extract out of a piece of software. It's an actual original piece of content that has structure and gets to the point. Yeah, I think life experience had a lot to do with my ability to do that. I was 50 at the time and had a lot of job roles. I initially trained as a secretary, but I'd also have a marketing qualification. So I knew about offline marketing as well. So I was able to apply those concepts to what you were teaching me to do, to put articles in the format that was going to be acceptable in the digital marketing world. It'd be sort of interesting today to chat about some of the changes that have happened over the last decade. I think content has still become it's still a very important pillar of um, driving a business. I still use content marketing as my primary marketing channel, and we still transcribe our podcasts into text format. Text is still very strong. Google's still a, a top search engine. That's not really changed much in the last 10 years. And now with Facebook, some of those long-form content pieces are driving lead magnets and generating activity for people. Are you still seeing uh, um, people have a demand for the written content? Oh, absolutely. Uh, One of the changes, though, I suppose, is the length of the content. When we started working together, we were writing articles that were around 400 words in length. But as you mentioned, the long form content has really come to the fore now. And that's what most of my clients are, are looking for. I think there's been a lot of studies published and I think Neil Patel comes to mind showing that long form content drives good search results and that they get good rankings and people stay on the site longer. These are all things that Google like to see if they're going to rank a site. Certainly uh, when we transcribe our podcasts and put them on a single post, they end up being quite long. Yeah. Also, I think there's probably some kind of arms war race, you know, with content. If you look over the last 10 years... Probably the quality of content has had to improve to even maintain the average, you know, like content inflation. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's the case. One of the problems, one of the hurdles that I face often, though, is when some of my clients want long form content, but the topic that they want it written about is so shallow and so targeted. There's, you know, to write a 2000 word article about something so irrelevant or unsubstantial is really difficult. So I have to then go back to them and say, either expand the brief or or let me write less. Because if there's one thing I hate, it's having to pad out an article in order to reach a word count. So they usually give you a topic or a draft or phrases or the open invitation to research. Well, I've got a fairly detailed brief that I'll ask my clients to complete at the beginning of a, a project. And that will include things like an avatar for their ideal client or just a description of their ideal client, uh, who their competitors are, where their authority sites might be that I could reference. If they want to give me keywords, by all means, they can do that. But I ask them for quite a bit of uh, information. And over the years, I think I've worked out what I need in order to deliver to the specification. Nice. So we went through quite a few phases. I remember in the very beginning, it was as many 400 word articles as we could get. I I looked up most of them. I think you were the first external contractor that I hired in my business. Yep. And the other one was the help desk. So those two things were critical maneuvers for me because I had someone else creating the content and someone else looking after the support requests, um, which in my case was people claiming a bonus because that was my primary strategy. But the way that I worked out that it was okay to do that was I was working out what's my return on investment. I think I was ordering articles 10 at a time Yep. and and lots of those 10 packs. Yep. And then I would publish them, sites like Ezine Articles and on my own website and, and a few other social media properties that were popular back then. And Hopefully, the traffic from that would cause enough affiliate sales to pay back the articles. And it didn't always come immediately. So I had to invest in the articles up front, and then I had to hope that they paid for themselves. And I think my theory panned out, and it worked well. And for years, we we had a a ton of articles come in. You actually built a whole business around that. You went from a temporary reception role at that front desk in a Mercedes dealership to having Kerry Finch writing.com. And uh, it's been wonderful watching you build that business and have the independence and you had a sea change as well in that time. And you've stayed close to the community interacting with 
when we have our annual events and I see you at some of the local meetups. It's um, how do your friends react to what you're doing? Because I'm sure it's still not that common a job, what you're doing. No, it's not common and certainly not common for somebody of my age. And I know a lot of younger people, when they do hear what I do and how I do it, they're, they're completely gobsmacked that this job exists and that I've created a business out of it. So I've learned to watch their eyes glaze over my contemporaries and I know when to stop talking about it when they've lost the plot. So you can only go into so much detail, but uh, I like that. I like that. And that's why I guess I love going to the local meetups and to your events because people, everybody gets what I'm doing and I get what they're doing. It's It's just a lovely community to be a part of. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Do you remember when we went to, well, we used to travel to different countries together, which was awesome because I really valued that support. You were kind of like my team manager. (laughs) (laughs) You know, we we would travel to different countries, went to the UK once, and I remember sharing what we do with this big audience. Uh, And they, I think it was like day two or three, they'd been spoken to by every other speaker over that event and they were kind of glazed over by the time they got to us. Yeah. We were dead last. I think we were second. It was so, so good. Second last until someone pulled out, right? Yeah, it wasn't quite that. This was in London and I'd been trying. They gave you a 90-minute slot and you really wanted more, but I couldn't get that for you. But then one of the other speakers pulled out and I think you were either before lunch or after lunch, I'm not sure, and the speaker that pulled out was on the other side of lunch. So I went uh, to you and said, uh, if I can grab that other spot, do you want it? And I saw your eyes light up and you said, go for it. (laughs) So we were going to try and get three hours uh, on stage with these hundreds of people in the audience. So the organisers weren't all that fussed with it. They said, oh, no, if you break it for lunch, it it slows down the momentum. And and we said, no, no, we can do this. We've got something organised. So they agreed. I think this was just the day before. So we went into uh, action mode and you changed around your whole presentation and then we went out shopping for hoodies, uh, which, which played a vital role because your um, sort of um, the image that went with your business at that time was of, the, of you with your head down with a hoodie on and, and so on. So what our plan was for you to do your regular talk about strategies and, and so on, which can be a bit analytical. But at the halfway point, when we about to break for lunch, you said that you'd like to uh, help a few people in the audience to apply those um, principles to their business. Who'd like to join you for lunch? And you know, everybody put their hand up and you picked out, I think, four or five people from the audience. And there was one person in particular, a woman who was very persistent. And you said, okay, well, you can come too, but you can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, oh, okay, okay, and everyone laughed. So those five or six people, all we took them off to um, a lunchroom that I'd organised and had a white, not a whiteboard, a flip chart put in there. And you asked them all to explain what their business was and what their challenges were, and you took each of them through the process of what they needed to do to get it on track or take it to another level. It was amazing. So they were happy with that. And then you told them that, okay, after this, when we go back on stage, you're going to have to tell people about this. And uh, they said, okay. So you gave them each a hoodie. And on stage, you asked me to bring on the flip chart, which I did. And I was quite unprepared for you to say, oh, and I want to introduce Kerry to you. And I had to tell my story about how we met and how I'd created my own business and and so on. And everyone was really taken with that. In fact, I got my first ever standing ovation after I left the stage. So I was famous by association for about an hour. (laughs) No, I think famous by uh, merit. Yeah. You earned that. Yeah. But then... That's why they call you the super finch, because you snagged the extra spot. (laughs) And uh, I remember handing the mic around to them saying, listen, we've just spent 10 minutes together. What did you learn? And they said, oh, you've just shown me why what I was doing was not getting the result and what I should be doing instead. And I remember people started running to the back of the room to buy what, whatever we were yep. selling. They didn't know how much yep. it was or what we were selling. That's right. Yeah, it was uh, It was amazing. Each of the people that you'd worked with went through the flip chart and explained to the people in the audience exactly what direction you gave them. It was just 
practical reinforcement of what you'd been telling everybody in the first half of the presentation was so powerful. And yes, people started moving towards the back, but then you moved on after they'd left the stage and you went down through some more details and then went into the the usual pitch mode where you told what the package was and how much it was and the price went down and more people moved to the back and then the price went down again and more people moved from the back. And the organisers saying to me, tell him to stop, don't let him go any lower because they want to buy at that price. And, you know, there was no way to do that. (laughs) So anyway, there was... At the end of it, there was um, complete mayhem at the back of the room and the next speaker who was, I don't know if you remember who it was, but he was pretty high profile at the time. He grumbles to the organisers, oh, now I have to go on stage after he's sold the f*** out of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Well, it's, you know, timing can be everything at, at these events because I remember at the event after that when we went to Dubai – one of the speakers from this event saw what we did and copied my whole slide deck. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep, same guy. And he spoke before me, mm. and then I had to redo my entire presentation. It's a dirty industry in some ways. I remember leaving that particular format of speaking because I didn't like some of the ethics of the other presenters and some of the promoters um, were a little bit slow on the payments sometimes as well. mm Gosh, I actually remember we sold 98 of our offer at £1,000 each. So it was a really productive afternoon. Yes. <laughs> the most remarkable thing was that I wasn't selling a live event or any actual physical thing this time. So it was a fully virtual delivery of what I was selling. And that's really where I started this sort of thought was what a magical environment we're in where we can create things in our imagination and translate that through our words on a page or in this case at an event. And people can enter into this magical world of business and marketing online. Oh, indeed. Another thing that was um, interesting about that event was that among your signups for that were crew and organisers of the event. That's true. And I think you've still got a couple in the forum now. This happens all the time. In fact, I just spoke in Queensland and I'm now coaching the event organiser. Oh, there you go. You know, it's like, and two of the other speakers have applied to work with me. So that's quite common. And, and I love it because these people are seeing all the speakers and they're running these events. That's right. The guy who was running the sound desk joined and is still in my community yep. and his wife. And, and this is, gosh, that was 2009 or something. It's really quite a long time ago. So It was, yeah. What a fantastic memory. He even moved from the UK to be there, to be in yeah. Australia, to be closer to you. <laughs> I know, he's in another state, but uh, <laughs> he's such a lovely guy. I like working with with people. I remember too with him, he had natural ability, and I think this is probably my knack, is if there's people around me who have special skills, I will notice them and then I will bring them out if possible. And I remember he was adding sound effects and doing cool stuff when I was presenting. And because we presented in Ireland as well, I just said, look, go for it. Whatever you think's appropriate, just use it. And he was adding in some some music, some soundtracks, some clips, and it was it was enhancing the performance. Yeah, exactly. The music he played when those five people marched on stage, you know, stealthily in their hoodies, it was just perfect. Yeah, so he he matched it. I think that was an extraordinary event and, and really – The takeaway there is to innovate. So don't just accept the way that things are always done and to entertain. I remember the bidding process when I offered people to come to lunch. They were standing on chairs and they're shouting and it was like a competition and some guys saying, oh, I desperately need to come. I've got eight kids and I've got no money and I don't even know what I do. I'm like, mate, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. (laughs) 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 Uh, And because I don't like the desperation card so much, I find that one is hard work yeah. and wrong attitude. So then, yeah, and and also, you know, the way that we did that was we actually created a result for people on the spot with a very low barrier for them. Like they didn't have to pay for that. They got the result first. So it's, it's really why I like to publish so many podcasts and I let people take the free course that I have on my website. I want people to get a result before they even want to become a customer, and that's a really low-risk way of moving forward into the business. Now, it's the same as 
if you're dealing with kerryfinchwriting.com, you're dealing with my very first and, and um, extraordinary writing talent who, you know, I, I guess we discovered a decade ago and, and you've got a long time in the trenches now. You're probably one of the most seasoned pros out there, uh, which is kind of funny from where we started. Yeah, indeed. It's uh, really funny. It's uh, so nice, though, to have so many members of your community as my clients, and they've been there for many, many years, probably from when we first started doing the uh, events, and they've stayed with me. And even if, you know, they drop off for six months or a year or so, they always come back. I'm always their, sort of their first choice to, to come back to, and it's just a lovely, lovely relationship between – I think that's just typical of your, your forum, your community – yeah, they're great. I was just looking at the average membership is now over three years for our members, which is mm. a testimony to the community. And it's made me think about running another event in uh, April 2019 in Sydney yep. to bring the family together. I'll be there. Uh, the band's getting back together. We went through a phase then of doing fairly intensive press releases. There was a time where it was easy wins for search engine results. It was good positioning and we were able to get great distribution. I'm wondering what sort of changes you've seen since the heydays of press releases. Do you still do them from time to time? I do them, but not in the same way that I did then. I mean, back in those days, press releases had become so popular that they equaled almost half of my writing business. It was phenomenal. I couldn't churn them out or load them to sites like PR Web fast enough. One client had me writing four each week. He was so ecstatic with the results. And it was amazing how I was able to make a sales pitch sound newsworthy. Maybe this is where fake news began its weird its ugly head, but <laughs> So the Super Finch invented fake news. <laughs> no. You said it. You said it, not me. No, no, I'm just I know I, I think propaganda's been around well before yep. uh, the internet. But I think there, there's a fine line with press releases, and I know that we always had this thing, like we've got to find something that's actually newsworthy or else we're really just bordering on web spam. So you, you've got to find the hook or find the story that needs to be told, and that's an important aspect of it. Yeah. And, and you know, the, definitely they had huge payoffs and dividends for – you know the system just worked at that time you could rank on the on the first page of google within hours of releasing a press release and some of them still turn up now when i'm searching for stuff which is interesting yeah very interesting yeah well before i was involved in digital business i was working in uh, marketing and writing offline press releases so i still do some of those and they're distributed through more um traditional aap type uh, distribution services, but they have very strict guidelines on what is and isn't news, and, and they're expensive, so it's not something that you can do for $65 like we used to in, with PR Web. It's hundreds and hundreds of dollars in order to get good distribution, but uh, you can quite easily target very specific niches through their the ways of um, vertical targeting. They're, they're very effective still, but it's got to be genuine news, and journalists aren't going to publish anything that isn't something that's going to be useful to readers. So we've talked about uh, short articles, long articles, press releases. Are there other types of content or copy that you are involved with? Uh, yeah, I'm doing a lot of lead gen reports. They're um, very uh, worthwhile. I think people are finding those, um, having those PDF reports on their websites very useful. It's, it's all about the giving and not always the taking. So reports that uh, deliver good value without uh, delivering the whole solution. So that's another big part of my business now. And um, social media posts. And I'm doing a lot of web page content as well. So if people are starting out their new websites from scratch, I'll do their home pages, their about pages and services and things like that. So web pages, I like doing those. I usually do those myself, whereas I give articles quite often to my team, but I like doing web page content. So you've built up a little bit of a team now and you've got, I think you've got like the international all-stars. Are they they're from all around the place? Yeah, mainly from um, North America and Australia. I've got one who is a specialist medical writer and she's in the UK, Nisha. And then in the Philippines, I've got Christine who 
is a lawyer and she's been with me for eight years now and she writes a lot of my legal content, mainly for the US and Australia. So, But the others are North American, Canadian, American and Australian. Right. So what do you think are the big issues when it comes to content? So if you sort of step into the mind of your average customer or very likely someone listening to this podcast, what things should they be considering when it comes to what sort of content they might be looking to produce? Well, I think without just looking at the content, I think they should be looking at the content plan realistically, that they don't ask for 10 articles like we did in the old days and expect instant search engine results. One of my key clients has been with me for four years now, and he just raves about how it has built up momentum over the years and how he couldn't do without my articles now. It's just given him such a solid base for his business. So I think approaching it realistically is good and not expect those instant results and that you have to be a bit patient in order for those articles to to give you the traction. But as far as the type of content, it's really mainly identifying who those ideal clients are, where their pain points are and offering solutions to that. I mean, nothing's really changed in that regard. It's always been so. And when you're actually sitting down to craft your article, do you break that into segments now? Have you got a formula that you like where you introduce the topic and you put forward some aspects and maybe counter them and come to an opinion or something like that? Yeah, yeah, exactly like that. And so that's the the formatting of the flow. But then also adding your subheadings and um, bullet points and things like that. And they've become increasingly important with mobile technology because people are reading content on their phones or or tablets now and they're skimmers more than ever and they want to see those bullet points and headlines so that they can easily see what uh, what the content's about before they explore it in more depth. Nice. Yeah, I think you have to optimise for the mobile. That's mm. very important. And, uh, yeah, right, for the two readers, the skimmer and the, the detail-oriented. Yeah. Do you put calls to action uh, throughout the body or just at the end? Well, sometimes I don't put calls to action. Sometimes it's all about the giving rather than any taking. So I will, no, I don't usually put a call to action throughout the article. I might embed an idea about the particular expertise of this client on, in this area, but a call to action I'll usually leave at the end. Right, so it might be the, the point of the article might be to bolster someone's authority so that they get better invitations from media, that sort of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Do you have anyone writing stuff for places like Medium, which I guess is probably the modern day equivalent of e-zine articles? Not specifically. I have one client in the US who is in that field, in the home improvement field, but but she's the only one. Yep. Most people putting the content on their own site? They're putting the content on their site or on social media. We sometimes recreate, we'll do a, a second version of an article. They might put one on their site, but then do a slightly different version to put on something like LinkedIn or on their Facebook page. And yeah. Yeah, LinkedIn's been a surprise for me. (laughs) Seems to like videos too. And I guess if you have that sort of content, it's easy to write around it where you can summarize or highlight timeline or curate what's in the video. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I know you didn't love LinkedIn at the start. Yeah, but I see you. I didn't like it up until a few months ago, really. And it was a community member of ours, Julie, was telling me how I might be able to use it better. And I gave it a shot and it's worked out to be quite effective and a surprise. So Mm. there you go. Mm. You've got to be open to trying new things or even trying things you've tried before a different way and get a different result. Yeah, yep, that's right. It's uh, it's a constantly evolving environment and you have to be there and give things a go and try them for yourself and not rely on what other people say as well. Well, sometimes not even relying on what you say. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I just remember I was having that discussion in our forum in Superfast Business just saying how I'm not really a fan of LinkedIn. And, and she just said, look, oh, would you like to hop on the phone and I'll just share with you a few different ways that you can you know, make it work for you better. And I did that and it worked better. So apparently it's more important to get profile views with LinkedIn than it is for most other metrics that you might look at. Mm-hmm. And if you can bolster that, then you really want to beef up your profile page because that's what they're looking at. And it's from there that you can have people 
you know, take that call to action. And I found that videos there, some of them are getting watched 50 times more than when I put them on Facebook or YouTube. So, you know, that's been, wow. that was the surprise. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yep. I also, I should point out um, that it was Julie Mason who helped me. She'd probably be thrilled to know that I've <laughs> given her a shout out. Maybe I have a come and talk about LinkedIn in more details, but um, when you repurpose it for different places, what sort of things are you taking into account? I think the different audiences, because all of those platforms are, have different audiences and you have to tweak it accordingly. Yeah. Because LinkedIn is mostly is B2B, whereas Facebook or your website might be B2C clients. So, yeah. Yeah, having a different conversation. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think if you're putting stuff on your own website, it's nice if you've got the original version of it, right? Because even if you put the same content on two different websites, a more powerful website will usually outrank the less powerful website, regardless of who published it first or, or whatever else. Yes, that's right. Things like interlinking words, do you still do that sort of stuff? Yeah, to a certain extent. We're linking probably to authority sites more than we used to. In the end, there was always the perception when I first started writing that if you put an external link in your content, you're taking your readers away to a different site. But now the search engines value those um, links to authority sites too. So we're, we're doing that sort of thing. Yeah, I know even, I guess, you know, if you're an old SEO head like us, it, you can't help it. I remember my last guest that I recorded on uh, the podcast before this one with Josh Marsden. I remember he was rattling off the tools that he works with. And I was just thinking while he was talking about those tools, how nice it will be uh, when Google comes along to that transcription and they hear about Infusionsoft and uh -uh. Click Funnels. Every time we mention a word and it gets transcribed, that's putting the content that our audience are searching for. So it, it makes mm. sense. I just did it then too. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other particularly uh, interesting memories of, of the last 10 years, some of the things that we've tried or, or done or seen with regards to content or anything around that? Mm, no, I was thinking about the different events that we used to do, and I know it was talking about that um, London episode was really good, but you balance that off with the, the probably the less enjoyable times. I remember when we were in New Zealand and you were working on your presentation until way after 3 a.m., and that time in Sydney where you lost your whole slide deck on the morning of the presentation and you were you were rebuilding it as the earlier speakers were on stage. But while you were doing it, you were accountering some of the textbook things they were coming out with and challenging concepts like having a five-year plan and, and that sort of thing. It was, uh, it was so funny to watch. <laughs> you just took a part there. Yeah. Oh, I'm such a contrarian. <laughs> That's kind of the thing with those multi-speaker pitch events – it's a competition for the audience's dollar and being competitive, you want to put yourself in a better position. It was super strategic. These days when I speak at content events, which is primarily what I do, is I will sit in the room and I'll support the other speakers' things that I agree with. So I guess I'm I'm softening up a little bit in my old age, Kerry. Oh, you are. You are. <laughs> also, that New Zealand event, that's where I met the original SEO contractors who I ended up building a business around that, that then we brought in house and turned into something quite significant. So getting out on the road and meeting interesting people was, it was a lot of fun back then. Yeah. You learn so much from, from others, what to do and more importantly, what not to do, I think. <laughs> Remember that time we turned up at the airport and you asked me if I had my itinerary and I didn't. <laughs> 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 so, you and the three other people were shocked. <laughs> I did have my passport, so. Yeah, but that's all right. I had the itinerary. <laughs> I also remember when we went to Dublin, we, we set off the um, metal detector and we somehow. Oh, we. That's the royal where You know it was me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just being polite, <laughs> but somehow he made it from Sydney to London all the way to this, the third airport they found, uh, was it a knife or something or a nail file? In your it was bracket? a pair of scissors. Scissors, right, scissors. Yeah. But that was kind of fun. But they couldn't find it. They could see it on, on the x-ray machine, but they, we took everything out of my bag and we still couldn't find them. And we realised that they'd actually worked their way, they'd cut their way through the lining of my bag and were sitting in there. So, you know, that was, yeah, that was just part of the course. But you're right, we made it from out of Sydney to London, 
to Dublin and we were on our way back from Dublin to London before they before it had actually set off any alarm. So that's a bit scary. Yeah, that's crazy stuff. Mm. So, you know, it's funny, like people look at my lifestyle now and the, the, the idea of working less, making more and surfing and stuff. But I did put in the effort. I really did with those all-nighters and slide builds and traveling and building audience, just earning that the hard way. But I think there's easier ways to do it now, and that's that's really why I was excited to put together a book and talk about how you might just sort of jump some of those steps. And it's like um, now, instead of having to figure out how to type articles or whatever, you just hook into an existing established service provider and just get it done. That's really the first big power move of my entire business was going from just me to me and Kerry and having that turning on the turbo. And that's when the affiliate commission started to accelerate when I was speeding up the amount of content that I could produce and put into the market. And if I look back at it, I think we had an advantage then because our content was significantly better than everyone else's content. Yeah. Because they were just spewing stuff out at the time. Mm. Uh, you know, ordinary, normal people were, were writing the articles and you were a pro. And then um, you figured out what works and you keep doing that. So it's been a really exciting ride. Yeah, it's been a great journey. Yeah. I love the quote in your 10 years podcast, and you said you can change almost every aspect of your life in a decade. And I know that's true for me, and I know it's true for you. Yeah, I think you could probably even do it twice in a decade. Yeah. <laughs> I'm being conservative, but it, it's absolutely, I think about if think about that day when you and I were sitting in my office when I had a job <laughs> and I was on a salary and you were a temp and we've both built our businesses out over that last 10 years and done something significant and it's a great celebration. Really look forward to I know you've spoken at my event and we've chatted a few times here and there, but it's really nice to look back and see how we got here and also what's changed. And I guess it's probably fitting to see where do you think things are going for me in particular? For you, and I guess when we talk about you, part of you is your business as well. So, like, how do you feel that's going to move forward? What sort of demands and changes do you see in the content world and from the sort of things your clients are asking you for? Because I know some of them are quite innovative and they they probably bring to you ideas and things they've seen. What sort of things do you anticipate we're going to be looking at over the next year or two? Yeah, interesting. I think they're all so very different and they're all tackling things in different ways. So I tend to, to just roll what, with what they're doing. And and I guess that's probably the the route I've chosen is to not uh, not explore any of those innovations, but to, to write according to the directions of them, understanding that in more often than not, they are the experts. But, you know, there are some things that I find that, well, I mean, it's not really speaking to your point, but there's, there are things that I find a little bit difficult to overcome. And often it's the perception that, I suppose I'll talk about law firms. It's it's law firms that uh, I can find quite challenging because they, and I do work for a lot of them, over 40 in the past. And it's the language they use. It's they, it's like they're speaking to impress their colleagues and their competitors. They're not speaking to to their audience, as you know, we've already touched on before. And I think that's what marketers and businesses really need to to focus on in the future is to just understand who their audience is. Oh, you made me smile big time. <laughs> I remember a, a lawyer client that I had and we were ranked at the top for SEO and we had fantastic traffic. All the leads were converting. We were just smashing it. And then remarketing came out and I asked them, to get from their creative agency some banners in these particular sizes so we can run remarketing. I explained to them what it was. They were like pretty blown away mm -hmm. that, you know, this whole concept. This is probably six years ago or whenever. And they came back and they said, oh, we've, we've also signed up with the agency for a new website. And I'm like, how much is that? And they said like $25,000. And they hired an actor from a well-known radio show here and – they had this video thing. So they scrapped the amazing site that we had mm. and they had this full page video guy just walking in and saying, 
hi, welcome to blah, 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 <laughs> legal. <laughs> right. It's like he's got, you know, it's like exactly what you said. He was like they were trying to impress other solicitors, yeah. not their target audience. And the thing dropped like a rock out of Google. It stopped converting and they had an emergency board meeting and they, they called me from their the group call and they said, can you please, oh, by the way, I fired them for that. Mm. I uh, said, I can't work with you guys because you've got no idea what you're doing. And they begged me to come back and save them. And I reinstalled the old site and we went straight back up the top of Google. It was like a $25,000 lesson in what not to do. My God, yeah. You know, they got hoodwinked by some fancy agency. You know, they just got it so wrong. Mm. It was really fascinating. It's like that's when I knew our street smart direct response internet marketing background tuned us into what works. Yeah, sometimes it's just sticking to the, your core principles and your and forgetting about all the flashy whiz bang lights flashing stuff and just go back to basics to a lot of extent. And that's where I find the uh, people often let written content in particular slide when they get distracted by other clever bells and whistles type things. And as you know, you know you're still doing content. I'm still writing content. It's really at the core of every digital marketing campaign and when people let it go it, it's really hard to claw back it's yeah i'm just yeah. enjoying a really great seo catchment from super fast business even transcribing these podcasts is enough yep. to, to drive an enormous amount of traffic i still haven't hooked up my um, super chat bots and all that stuff yet mm, all the fancy stuff yeah. i do believe in good design and i think that goes hand in hand if you can make your content look nice especially those PDFs and uh, your homepage and any landing page, if you can make them look nice, I love getting help from Greg Merrilies for that, yep. then it's a nice way to wrap the good content. So if your content's actually good and you create it and it looks good and it speaks to your audience, then I guess you've ticked a few boxes that your competitors might be missing. Yeah, yep, I agree, yep. Well, great to catch up, Kerry. Any words of wisdom in, to our listener as parting advice? Um, no, um, well, yes, I'd say stick, if you're not already in James's community and you um, want more of this sort of guidance, the kind of um, mentoring that James has given me over the last 10 years, and especially in those early stages, I get into the super fast business and, and learn from James and learn from learn from the others in there. It's a, such a dynamic community and and I'm really pleased I've been there from the start. Oh, that's that's very nice. I will mention kerryfinchwriting.com. Hey, let's do that one more time. <laughs> and balance that ledger. <laughs> yeah, if you want to get some good content from the very first person that I worked with with content, then I recommend you head over there and get some help from Kerry. So, Kerry, wonderful to chat and be good to catch up at least. Hey, I'll see you next April. At the latest in another 10 years and see okay. what's happening then. <laughs> Thanks, James. Bye. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you then first. <laughs> bye bye. Discover how to build your business super fast. Check out superfastbusiness.com. Thank you.